Wow, what a great looking group. I'm Milton Clipper, President and CEO of Public Broadcasting Atlanta. On behalf of our Board of Directors, the staff at Public Broadcasting Atlanta, and our licensee, the Atlanta Public School System, we'd like to welcome each of you. We would also like to thank some very special guests, including participants in the film all the way from Mobile, Alabama, the Library of Congress, Bank of America, and our special friends of the Rialto Center. And it's always a pleasure to join Nancy Hall and her staff at Georgia Public Broadcasting in co-hosting this evening's special event with one of the great storytellers of our time, Ken Burns, and one of America's best radio hosts and moderators, Valerie Jackson. Earlier today, we had the pleasure of presenting Ken Burns and his documentary to some very special people, veterans of the Second World War to the people of the, from that generation of Americans who lived through it, the Second World War was the defining event of the 20th century. It was the most dangerous and deadly conflict ever inflicted on the planet. At stake was the fate of the world. So we asked some ordinary people to do some extraordinary things. This film gives all of us the opportunity to remember those who were called upon to put their lives on the line to keep America free. Those who have known war up close will never forget it. Calvin Coolidge said, the nation which forgets its defenders will be itself forgotten. Public Broadcasting Atlanta is honored to help Ken Burns tell the story of these great American heroes in a way that we will never forget. This outstanding documentary created by Ken Burns not only gives us pause to never forget the sacrifices it took to be free, but also the sacrifices we, was, we must make to remain free. This evening, we will get the behind-the-scenes stories of some of our country's most valiant veterans. Please check your WPBA TV 30 schedule for our airing of the war. Again, thank you for being here and welcome. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce a wonderful partner, the Executive Director of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you, Milton. Good evening, everyone. All of us from Georgia Public Broadcasting are pleased to be a part of this event with our friends from Public Broadcasting Atlanta and delighted to be able to share this extraordinary evening with all of you. Let me first take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to our GP board and members, our advisory committee members here this evening who have come from Rome and Savannah and Macon. With us this evening is our chairman of the Foundation of Public Broadcasting in Georgia, Michael McDougall of Rome. Thank you, Mr. McDougall, for joining us, who is also the vice chair of our GPB board of directors. Thank you to our many GPB partners who are attending this evening and to all those who helped make this event possible from PBA and GPB and the Rialto. And especially to each of you strong supporters of the mission of public broadcasting to educate, inform, and enlighten. Our viewers and listeners who value the important role that public broadcasting plays in our society, thank you for your financial contributions. We're pleased that you're here tonight for this very special preview of the war with renowned filmmaker Ken Burns, a remarkable storyteller we know. And today, one of our veterans proclaimed him a true American treasure. The war premieres on GPB Sunday, September 23rd at 8 p.m. It will be shown across the nation in September. Be sure to mark your calendars for that date. You will not want to miss this important 
event. We also have several of our special GPB original productions airing in conjunction with the broadcast. Remembering the War, a Georgia Traveler special that showcases World War II related sites all across the state. And Georgia Remembers the War, special segments featuring, featuring the reflection and reflections of Georgia veterans and other Georgians affected by World War II. You should have received a flyer tonight with broadcasting information about the programs on GPB and PBA. If not, they will be available when you leave. For more information about the broadcast of the programs, as well as all of our World War II initiatives, especially our World War II Oral History Education Project, please visit our website at www.gpb.org. And now it is my pleasure as well as a great personal privilege to introduce Ken Burns, truly someone who needs no introduction to this crowd. Ken's award-winning work with films like jazz, baseball, and of course the Civil War have been thoughtful, powerful, and personal. And with each project, he has provided a new perspective on the American experience. The war focuses on personal stories, and in doing so, the film successfully brings one of the biggest, most dramatic events in the history of the world down to a very intimate scale. And now, to give you the story behind the making of this momentous project, The War, please welcome Mr. Ken Burns. Ken. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. My goodness, I have now had two extraordinary welcomes in Atlanta. It's always great to be back here, and I felt compelled at lunch to inoculate myself by telling you a little story. I live in a tiny village in uh, New Hampshire, and uh, the, uh, it's smaller than the people in this room. It's fewer people. And I have on my refrigerator for the last 30 years, an old and now faded New Yorker cartoon that shows two men standing in hell, the flames licking up around them, and one guy says to the other, apparently my over 200 screen credits didn't mean a damn thing. <laughs> but, which is very serious in New Hampshire where any bit of notoriety plus 50 cents gets you a cup of coffee at the local cafe. But I thank you for the warm uh, welcome that I have received today. It's great to be back here. It's been uh, just a few years. Of course, the first time through was with the Civil War, and, and that was important. Um, I, I wanted to know uh, if there, if somebody could raise their hand, if there are veterans in the audience of the Second World War. Could you raise your hand? We can acknowledge you. We made this film for you, uh, and that's who it's for. Uh, I am also very pleased to tell you that two dear, dear friends of mine who are people in the film uh, that have become friends over the six-and-a-half-year project uh, length, uh, and they've come, as was mentioned, from Mobile, and I'd just like to ask uh, Sid Phillips and his sister, Catherine Phillips Singer, to stand, and, and uh, you'll meet them in a second up there, but meet them right now. Would you stand up, please? They're two of the secret weapons of our film, and more on that in a second. I'm also, because this is public television, want to thank those of you who support public television. And I particularly want to thank the underwriters uh, of our series, the corporate underwriters, that include Bank of America. They're here tonight, Anheuser-Busch, uh, General Motors. Uh, we don't... Uh, expose a frame of film without your support, and we are very, very grateful. As has been said a few times this evening, I think that on September 23rd at 8 o'clock, it's a Sunday night, PBS will begin broadcasting our seven-part, 14-and-a-half-hour series on the American experience in the Second World War entitled simply, 
the war. It comes precisely 17 years to the moment after our series on the Civil War was first broadcast, a Sunday at 8 o'clock uh, on the 23rd of September. And as I said at lunch today, I, it's a little bit daunting to think that I've worked 17 years and all I've been able to do is remove the word civil from my work. Um, <laughs> That, that film, that earlier film, began with a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. He had been wounded six times during the Civil War and would go on to serve his country again as a justice of the United States Supreme Court. He said, we have shared the incommunicable experience of war. We have felt, we still feel, the passion of life at its top. In our youths, our hearts were touched with fire. Holmes was trying to put into words what every soldier who has faced combat knows in his or her guts that paradoxically when your life is most threatened, when violent death is possible at any moment, any moment, everything is vivified. Your experience of life heightened to a degree not found in any other part of your life. And so war creates an unusual terror to be sure and yet an also a compelling attraction. We see in war the very worst of us but also the very best of us. Now, after we had finished the Civil War series, we vowed that we would never do another film on war. We like to think of ourselves as emotional archaeologists, uninterested in excavating the dry dates and facts and events of the past, but more involved with bringing home the human stories. And as a result, we feel that we too had been touched by the war uh, and experienced all of the horror of that and did not want to go back. In fact, in the Civil War, soldiers who had been in combat, actually been in combat, said they'd seen the elephant. I think they were thinking of the most exotic thing they could think of, seen the elephant. And we too felt in a way that we'd seen the elephant and vowed over the 1990s that we would not do another film on war. Uh, but two equally awful statistics began to erode that conviction for us. First, we learned to our horror that we are losing 1,000 veterans of the Second World War each day in America. That means that we are losing among our fathers and our grandfathers a direct connection to an oral history of this unusually and admirably reticent generation. That if we, the inheritors of the world they so worked so hard to create for us, to save for us, did not hear them out, we would be guilty of a historical amnesia too irresponsible to countenance. Um, that stopped us in our tracks. I'm in the memory business, and every time a man dies, a soldier dies, he takes with him, like a library burning down, all of those volumes of memory. And uh, I could not abide by that. Uh, second, we learned to our horror that many of our graduating high school seniors think we fought with the Germans against the Russians in the Second World War. I'm glad you're all uh, sitting down. My own knees tend to buckle a bit when I repeat a statistic I've known like a dark family secret uh, for more than a decade. Uh, it means that we are losing not only our soldiers, but losing our historical compass in this world. And if we do not know the essential facts of why we fought the Second World War, then we are in deep, deep trouble uh, as a republic. And so six and a half, seven years ago, we vowed that we would take on the Second World War. We wanted to do it entirely differently from anything that had been done before. We wanted to tell the European and the Pacific theaters of war simultaneously, not separated. Uh, we wanted to also honor the home front and not keep them disconnected from that. Go on. Oh, wait, here we are. I'm back. Most countries about the Second World War focus on... Um, the other, just the Pacific theater or just the European theater or just the home front. We wanted to tell them simultaneously. We also felt that too many films uh, either gave you World War II 101, that is to say, lots of context with absolutely no soul, no intimacy, or others that drop you down into a specific moment but offer no... Can you hear me now? <laughs> we also saw that a lot of films are distracted by what I think is the unnecessary clutter of the description of this war that helps to keep it kind of at a remove, a briefly gallant, bloodless myth. You know, we call it the good war, and how could it be a good war? It is the worst war. 
Um, these films are distracted by an unnatural interest in celebrity generals and politicians, by strategy and tactics that reduce human lives to just arrows on a map. Uh, they're distracted by that American obsession with guns and armaments and weaponry uh, to the exclusion of what the fighting really meant. And of course, in recent years, we've seen a disturbing trend in a lot of the documentaries in which there's a kind of admiration for the Germans' early military successes and their, you know, incredible efficiency. I do not share that enthusiasm uh, for the German army or its uh, early impressive victories. And so we were looking to clear out that dead wood, and we decided to do this tell our story entirely from the bottom up, not the top down, but the bottom up, with so-called ordinary people. And we quickly learned, of course, that in extraordinary times, there are no ordinary people. And at the heart of the covenant, the compact of our great republic, is the notion that we do not have a royalty, we do not have a tyranny of celebrity, we do not have a tyranny of those with bold-faced names. We actually do, in every poor, support the notion that everyone in this room is extraordinary. Everyone who fought in that war is extraordinary. And so we decided to tell the story of the Second World War entirely differently from the bottom up by choosing to focus on the fortunes of people from most, most of whom come from four geographically distributed towns. Um, we are in tremendously excited about this. It is not an encyclopedic comprehensive history of the Second War. It is impressionistic. It is anecdotal. And yet, paradoxically, we learned to our great delight that as we were invested with the personal, we also became concerned with the general, that, that the ability to do both was possible in this approach. And we're also very pleased to be working with public television because it has afforded us an opportunity for the most elaborate educational outreach um, that has ever been mounted in this country in connection with the television program. We're doing our normal outreach to the schools, uh, both online and in hard copies, and every history class in America will have a chance uh, to get some of this material. But we have also encouraged public television over the last few years to encourage its local affiliates to produce films in the same model, the same bottom-up way. And I'm happy to report, not only here in Georgia, but around the country, more than 40 films have been completed, which will follow in the footsteps of this larger national production. These local stations have also initiated 117 local oral history projects urging their citizenry to come forward and tell their stories uh, before they pass from the scene. And we have partnered with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project uh, to begin to record on a national level these things. Our kids may not know who we fought with or against in the Second World War, but they all have access to a DV camera. And if they go to the website of the Library of Congress or pbs.org backslash the war, they can begin to download uh, lighting and shooting instructions, sample questions from us, and they can go out and ask grandpa or great grandpa, grandma or great grandma, Uncle Charlie, the guy down the street, what they did, and record it for a grateful republic who will hold it with all the other incredible testimony that the Veterans History Project has already collected, tens of thousands of oral uh, testimonies that will help us um, keep their memory alive. It's, it's very clear that I could not have made this film 10 or 15 years ago. These veterans were not yet ready to speak. And of course, in five years, many of them will be gone, and it will be impossible to have that. And it will no longer be possible to record a direct um, reference to the Second World War. It will become the abstract province of historians. And as good as they are, they will not be able to describe uh, the, the horrors, the interiors of combat, and in the end, that's what we wanted to do, show exactly what happens in war. Now, <laughs> filmmakers hate to show clip reels. It's just the worst thing in the world. And so I've asked the ushers to lock the doors. And you will be out at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> if, if we don't take any bathroom breaks, which I'm sure you agree that we don't need. Um, 
we are going to show you a handful of clips, about seven, totaling just a little bit over an hour tonight, and then we will join you for some conversation, and I really look forward to that. Uh, the first large section is from the intro, so it needs no introduction. It sets the table of what we're doing uh, in this film and introduces you to, I think, this unique way of trying to understand what we'll shortly call the greatest cataclysm in human history. We then jump to our uh, third episode where we continue the story of the uh, uh, Philip Singer family and uh, their experiences in the war. We've already met them before, and indeed we've spent a good deal of time with Sid in a section I'm not showing you in the Battle of Guadalcanal, where he turns uh, 18 years old, 18 years old, in the middle of this terrifying four-month uh, battle, when for much of the time he was fairly confident that he was expendable, that the U.S. Navy had been unable to uh, defend them and had slipped away and they were left without supplies or hope of resupply against a very formidable foe. Uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll jump to our fourth episode where instead of showing you as much as I'd like to the hour-long section on the landing at Omaha Beach, uh, show you the very short reaction to it uh, in our country. There you'll meet again Al McIntosh, one of the great Greek choruses of our film. We'll stay in our fourth episode for the next clip, the continuation of the Battle of Saipan, which is narrated in part uh, by a, a, a man who's now passed away, and so we've had to use the actor Robert Wahlberg uh, to tell his story, a man named James Fahey, a sailor who has watched the, the proceedings. And Saipan is a particular particularly horrific uh, Pacific uh, battle insofar as it is the first time Americans have had to deal with a large Japanese civilian population, which will complicate this story to the, the, the worst possible conclusion and degree. Uh, then we'll take a little break, jumping backwards in time to our second episode to a little refreshing break from uh, what's going on, and then jump to the very last episode of the film, the seventh episode, in a, another section that will need absolutely no introduction to you. And then we'll end with um, a piece of music and some images um, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, my father passed away in 2001, and he uh, was a veteran of the Second World War. And I had the unhappy task of carrying his ashes from Michigan, where he died, to New Hampshire, where I live. And I heard on public radio, of course, this beautiful anthem sung by an opera singer, Denise Graves, the great mezzo-soprano. It didn't seem appropriate, but the music and the words of this song so stunned me that I pulled over the side of the road and cried like a baby, as much for the horrible cargo I was carrying as for the uh, beauty of this song, and it was beautiful. I contacted the composer. He told me that he was in the opera world and it had been hijacked. He had fully intended for his anthem to be recorded by a popular singer. It was an anthem. And I played it for the editors. They began to use the melody throughout the film, and you'll hear it almost instantly in the film as we begin the uh, investigation of the four towns that we follow. And um, and yet the, the lyrics had always haunted me. So what I'm going to do to end the visual presentation of the evening is combine all the uses of this film as a kind of table of contents of the imagery of our film. Uh, I was able to get that popular singer, uh, a young woman with an unusual voice, a gift from God, perhaps the best singing voice out there today, Nora Jones, uh, who I think hits a home run uh, with this beautiful, beautiful uh, song and beautiful, beautiful lyrics by Gene Shear, uh, by the way. And that will end the visual presentation. And then Valerie and I look very much forward to our conversation and then one with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming out this evening. It's always great to come back to this this city that is so aware of its history, and uh, I can't wait to hear your response to this. Thank you so much. Good evening. <laughs> Actually, I saw that preview a few days ago, but it still, even seeing it again, has made me speechless as I see so many of you appear to be. Whew. I'm sorry. It just takes me a minute to kind of get together. It's kind of hard to just jump right into the conversation after that. It is indeed. Oh, but I want to ask you, one of the first young men that spoke, and I say young because he was young then, he said that this was 
that World War II was a necessary war. Yeah. What qualifies as a necessary war? I mean, is there, uh, you know, what, what kind of war is necessary? It's a good question. Um, I, I think he's saying that in part because he's rejecting the notion that World War II has come down to us now as the good war. And he's saying there's, of course, no such thing as a good war. They're only necessary and perhaps just wars. And one could find in the annals of human history so many examples of wars uh, that should not have happened. And in a few instances, wars that had to happen in terms of the Second World War uh, to defend ourselves against that fascism, that militarism. Um, Ray Leopold, who just passed away, by the way, two weeks ago, which has just left a gaping hole in our, in our big extended family, uh, describes in another part of the film interviewing a German who he, had been captured, and the German basically grills him, Ray, in perfect English, just perfect accentless a English on um, uh, where he was from. He said, America. He says, where in America? The Northeast. Where in the Northeast? The guy was very persistent. I'm from Connecticut. Where in Connecticut? He pressed further. He said, I'm from Waterbury. He goes, ah, on the banks of the Naugatuck and Mad River. Now, Ray says, you have to know a little bit about geography, but the Naugatuck's a pretty principal river, but the Mad River is a small stream you could jump over. It was my turn to ask him questions. Uh, how do you know this? I was in charge of administration. Administration of what? Uh, Ray persisted. He said, administration of the territories. Hitler had trained an entire cadre of people who were prepared to take over every inch of the United States. To me, that makes it a necessary war. That's scary. That is it scary. is terrifying. It wasn't just Europe he was after. Everything. He was going after Waterbury. Yeah. Waterbury. And Atlanta. <laughs> and Atlanta. He had somebody ready. We, we weren't really prepared for this war, for World War II, especially with Japan. Um, do you see parallels with wars that have come since then? Vietnam, well, you, Iraq. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We were not prepared for any aspect of this war. We had, in 1940, an army smaller than that of Romania. Um, we were using leggings dating back to the 19th century, guns that had been designed in 1903. We still wore tin hats. We had more cavalry horses than we had tanks. Um, the impressive thing is that um, we found ourselves wholly unequipped to fight this war, still reeling from the Depression, and within three and a half years had completely transformed everything. I mean, one of the stories, this film spends about 75% of its time in battle, and I want to ensure you all, there's lots of funny things in this film. People fall in love um, and get married, and they tell jokes, and uh, we spend about a quarter of the time in at home. Uh, dealing most of the time with the impressive and radical transformation of the American industrial might. Um, but we were not prepared, and it, it seems so frustrating in a way that in the wars we've been prepared for, we've been actually uh, unable to prosecute them as fully as we were in this case. Uh, someone once said to me in an evening not dissimilar to this, he said, uh, we don't start wars, we finish them. That's what the United States is good at doing. And, and we were wholly unprepared for many of the wars, uh, or the most glorious wars we've been involved in, if that's a phrase you can use. When, when you did the film, or the series rather, The Civil War, you said that if we look at the history of this country, the Civil War would be the traumatic event of our childhood. What then was World War II? It's a really great question. Um, I do think that it's important for us to see our history in the same sympathetic way you'd see the life of a friend. Uh, and that it's very clear that the Civil War was the great traumatic event of a childhood that sort of defined us. And everything that we've become is a consequence of it. It's interesting. The Civil War still is the most important event in American history. But the Second World War is the most important event in world history in terms of things. And I think how we... Uh, the role we played in it was central. So, of course, uh, the Second World War is this watershed moment, 
almost all of the world that we're grappling with in good ways and bad ways has issued from the Second World War. So it has enormous consequence. Uh, but it, it is just one of those great trials of adulthood, if we continue this metaphor of us, of a country having the, the life of a human being, uh, and not the same formative uh, thing that the Civil War has. I mean, particularly this town, I don't need to tell anybody the way in which when you say the war, they say you mean the late unpleasantness, or the war against the states, or the war between the states, or whatever, and not the, and not the Second World War. You mentioned that there was humor in this series, and um, as a matter of fact, I remember a few uh, items in the book that, that were humorous. One in particular was the um, the elderly man who wanted to re-up or right. reapply, but he had some missing teeth. And the army <laughs> wouldn't let him in. He said, what do they want me to do, bite the enemy? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to bite the Japanese to death? <laughs> it's, you know, it's really important. Uh, it, this is why, again, why filmmakers hate clip reels, because you sort of uh, put the scenes in and, the, and all the context, all the familiarity. You've already spent a good deal of time with, for example, Sid Phillips before you meet him here in the third episode, not in Tarawa. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ray Leopold, we've spent a great deal of time with up to this point. And, and the point also is to understand the amount of humor and sort of family life uh, and, and the way in which we soldiers on, the way in which we got down to business in this country. There are ironies also to me uh, how a truce would be called and both sides, the German or the Americans or whomever, would go out collect and bury their dead. You know, you will find this in almost every recollection of the war. You can go back into the classics, uh, into Herodotus, and you will find these moments in war. And war brings out the, the very worst, of course, but also the very best, as I said, uh, where people are sharing hospitals. And it was not uncommon in the Civil War. We found that all the time. And in the First World War and the Second World War, to have these sort of unspoken truces. Um, where people were using the same barn as a, as a medic station uh, and they would just look across the barn and nod and, and the medics of each uh, nationality would go about their work. You know, it's hard to believe that that could happen today in the way uh, things are so desperately conducted uh, and uh, yet we begin to see these little glimpses of humanity in, in the midst of this horrible inhuman depravity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. V-mail. It was mentioned in the clip, V is in victory. Talk about what that was for those. Well, it was just a wonderful system of getting mail uh, to people. You know, you wrote a letter and uh, it was re-photographed in what is essentially 16 millimeter film. Uh, and of course, very small. It's like micro filming it. And then it's sped around the country and then it's clipped off however many frames or pages of your letter and then blown up again. And, and uh, you know, people assumed that uh, you didn't get mail for weeks and weeks and sometimes that was the case. But in V-mail, uh, there are instances where it was just a few days that you would get uh, a letter from a soldier in some obscure uh, remote theater of the war and it would be back there from the Aleutian Islands and all of a sudden you'd have it just a few days old. You and I talked earlier today, and um, when I was interviewing you for my Between the Lines show, but uh, <laughs> we talked about the difference between, and it was mentioned in the film, the, the Japanese uh, warrior, the, 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 you know, never give up. Um, but we mentioned how racism, as in the Civil War, played a part in World War II also, and that's why I mentioned the Japanese. But let's, let's talk about that. It's a complicated time. thread to follow. You know, the Japanese had a Bushido code, which was um, devastating to their army, and of course inscrutable to us, as Sam Hines quite correctly says in Saipan. There was oh, just what some, kind of code? It was called the Bushido code, which was about not giving up, about uh -oh. not surrendering. Mm -hmm. It was a fierce honor code that is, you know, not unknown in other cultures, something similar to that. Uh, but it is true uh, that it was more often than not that you would get a large group of Germans or Italians, as um, was said in that same section, um, to surrender when a Japanese would fight to the, to the death. And this was a mysterious thing and helped to make them a much more easily vilified enemy. 
And it's so interesting when we think about this country as a melting pot with huge uh, Italian-American population, German-American population, and a growing Japanese-American population. There were some German nationals, aliens, in this country who were rounded up uh, after Pearl Harbor, and some Italians as well. Uh, but only the Japanese Americans and those on the West Coast were all put in. All, you know, most of them American citizens, or at least the parents of American citizens who've been here for years and years and years, and uh, were rounded That's what up. That's I'm and talking about. Why were the Japanese interned, but the it has German to do with Americans race. It has to do. Italian it has to do with the otherness of 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 people. I remember when I finished the Civil War, a young girl asked me, "What is racism?" She was about 12 years old in a big crowd, and. We were talking, and it's really, it's the, it's the understandable flip side, the terrible flip side of a very understandable thing, which is the love of one's own. We get suspicious of people who are different from us, and we act in wholly unexpected and usually not very good ways. And the story of human history is often the story of the mistakes we make judging people not as a citizen of this city said by the content of their character, but by the color of their skin. We, it was mentioned that approximately 60 to 70 million that we know of may have been killed during the war. I think it's more closer between 50 and 60, and we will never know. Mm -hmm. It's not over 60, but it, we will never, ever know, and that's what part of this horrific calculus of war brings us. Well, the arithmetic was only about the dead, though. What about the casualties, the psychological, the, the, the emotional casualties, the, the social casualties, the divorces, the so forth? You have not met yet several hugely important characters, or you've only been briefly introduced, Glenn Frazier, uh, who ends up, you know, uh, getting so angry that he ha ha goes through the bar at the opening moments of this film. And then in every episode, we follow his unbelievable exploits. A uh, woman who was 8 to 12 during the war, a native of the Sacramento Valley, but found herself in Manila. Her family had large holdings there and was a prisoner of the Japanese. Uh, left a diary, and we interviewed her. Uh, other people, uh, like Quentin Adamson, the pilot from Laverne, Minnesota, who plays a huge role in the film. All of them live, I believe, with a daily reminder of the war, that there isn't a night that goes by or a day that goes by without the war in some ways possessing them in not altogether pleasant ways. Now, a lot of times we, we can't just take this at face value and assume this is all bad. I think people have redirected this energy, as painful as it is, into an amazing life. This gentleman here, Sid Phillips, Dr. Sid Phillips, did exactly what he said he wanted to do in the Tarawa scene when he was in New Gloucester, looking at the wounded and feeling powerless. He made a career of medicine and uh, has spent his life saving lives, which is an amazing redirection of all of the incredible negativity of what he saw, all the death, all of that, he transformed it. And others, including those who are burdened in very personal ways by the war, and uh, some of them were shocked even in our film just to, to expose themselves to that. Paul Fussell, who you see introducing the Holocaust film, was a well-known historian uh, of this war and other wars, and yet we were interested in him just as a 19-year-old in battle who at one point, uh, one six-month period, never changed his clothes, never took a shower, never brushed his teeth, and his average life expectancy was 14 days. Mm. You were either killed or severely wounded, and after six months of that, defying those horrific odds, he was finally severely wounded, and he went to the front of the line to be patched up, to be ready for the invasion of Japan. He was good at his job, and his job, ladies and gentlemen, was killing other people. He did it really, really well. And this is a man who's written many books about it, but by the time he got to our interview, it was as raw as anything, and almost every recollection would set off this, this, this teary, sort of trembling as, as if the, the memories had been tamped down and were now suddenly boiling again uh, in a way that he said to me between the roles, I, I, I don't know why I'm like this. And I said to him, you saw bad things. And it, the lip started going and the cheek would twitch. And you, you can see that the war, the casualties of the war are forever. As a documentary filmmaker, do you see yourself as a conduit of information, basically? Or is there another role that you prefer to play? 
That is a great question, Valerie. I think it's a combination of things. Because I've chosen, I, I feel that I'm an artist. I'm not trained as a historian. I'm trained as an artist, as a filmmaker. And so part of that is the exchange of art, which is you do something. And Tolstoy said that art is the transfer of emotion from one person to another. And I think that in many ways, many of us this evening have had that transfer taken place. At the same time, I'm not doing this through artifice. I don't have to make this up. I'm able to sit in front of remarkable human beings like the Phillipses and listen to their stories and find a way to arrange their stories and interbraid them and intertwine them with other people uh, and work with, may I say, also extraordinary colleagues who are in their own right artists, writers like Jeffrey Ward, my co-director and co-producer Lynn Novick, who's not here tonight, um, but uh, people who, who are engaged in this process. And at the same time, part of it is this documentary effort to get out of the way of a good story. I mean, what do I need to do to Sid Phillips to change the effectiveness of his story? You're looking at that footage of the water pouring out of people. You're seeing the wounded being brought by. You have that amazing photograph of uh, uh, surgery uh, going, taking place in some godforsaken bunker, and you can imagine the bombs bursting overhead. So who, 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 who was taking that photograph? You know yes, I mean? yes, like. of course I do. <laughs> and these are the unsung heroes who we credit in each uh, episode of the film. These are the combat photographers, and to a much lesser extent, the Im what we'd call embedded journalists who went along and took pictures and filed reports and brought the war back. You know, er Eric Severide, who had you know parachuted into Burma, been through many aspects of the, the war from the beginning to the end, and the amazing CBS correspondent finally despaired at the end of the war that he had actually done. He said, you know, those of us who have the luxury of being journalists are, not, are there by choice. Uh, the soldier has no choice. So we will never be able to accurately re mm. reflect how he was. It's right back there to Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, Jr., and his comment about the unknowability of war. And he said this amazing thing, Severide, he said, your sons will be forever strangers. But if, by some art uh, or genius, a few of them can come forward and tell what happens, then perhaps we will know what it was really like. And I feel so privileged as an American more than anything, as a filmmaker secondarily, to sit in the presence of the 40-odd people that you get to know in this series and listen to this thing that is happening, that art and that genius from them, not from me, of telling their story that permits a sense of what it was really like. Just a taste of it. We'll never know really what it was like. And most of them, as you know, came back and watched the, saw in the equation, the human social equation, the impossibility. Because war, we have to remember, is the lie of civilization. The lie? The lie of civilization. We see ourselves as civilized, advanced mm. people, and the choice of war is always a betrayal of that. And part of the compact is, is that you get children to fight the war. Those people who have a sense of immortality, those boys mostly, but now ma who women as well, in the stream. who think that they're mm -hmm. immortal and they go off to war and become professional killers. They grow up mm. overnight, and you can see this. At one point, Fussell was talking to me about this, and he kept saying, and they would send me these kids, these replacements, these kids, and I'd said, between Rose Paul, how old were these kids? And he said, 18. I said, how old were you? He says, 19. That's right. The leaders, <laughs> the leaders were only one or two years older than the soldiers, and, and some of them lied to get in. And they were in. now old men, in a way. They yeah. were old souls, what they had to see. And then they come back to a country that says, good job, now stop being professional killers. They don't even say that. They don't even acknowledge that that's what they've asked you to do. They just say, that's great. Thank you so much. Now, now act normal. And people like Len Frazier, people like... Sid's best friend, who's a major character in our film, uh, Eugene Sledge, could not let it go. And the war ate at them and spoke to them, and, and they had to find each in their own way, sometimes through God, sometimes through science, sometimes through a combination of this, sometimes just with the love and generosity and patience and forbearance of family and friends, a way to put these horrible experiences. I mean, imagine they did bad things, they saw bad things, they lost good friends, and then come back and 
the, the, the people around them couldn't distinguish between those who pounded a typewriter for the, the, the war and those like Sid who were on the front line who, who daily right. experienced this. Well, I didn't mean to pick on you all night. So. <laughs> we, we, we did promise that we would allow and open the floor up for a few questions from the audience. And, and I do want to keep that promise, so we just oh. have time for just a few. But if there are some questions from the audience, I do believe we have the some hand mics on um, either side of the room. I can't see them from up yes, here. Yes, they're right here, right at the end of the aisle. There's some Oh, right, down here at the end of the aisle. If you have a question, you can come forward quickly. Come and, on forward, sir. There's a microphone They're all the way right down there. here to the Please. front. It's a very, very hard uh, thing to discover. You know, I, there's so many similarities in all war that I feel that if you could import someone from Iraq, but also someone from the Peloponnesian Wars, they'd recognize the essence of what we were able to touch in moments in the Civil War and in this film. Uh, the Civil War series and in, in the war. That is to say, you know, they would say, I was scared, I was bored, I was hot, I was cold. My officers didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't give me the right equipment. I saw bad things, I did bad things, I lost good friends. I mean, that is time immemorial. And I think you would find a similarity in that. I think what we find today is that uh, we miss that shared sacrifice that, that the World War II brought us, the sense of community. We, we yearn for community now, and we now have a separate military class that suffers its losses apart and alone from the rest of us. How many people here know someone in Iraq? That is the hugest percentage I have seen since I've been on the road outside of the military uh, service academies and the forts that I've been at. It's usually 2% of the population. And so I think part of that's the problem. There's been a failure of leadership to involve us, all of us, in this war, to make the kind of sacrifices. After 9-11, we were asked to go shopping. I was willing to do anything for my country, to be asked to drive slower, to pay more taxes, to get things done. We could have spent, I mean, if we were able to do in three and a half years in the Second World War what we were able to do, think what we could have done in the six years since 9-11 to perhaps rid us of dependency on foreign oil or a host of other things. And um, I think... I, I think we just don't know now. Americans are really torn in half, and we yearn for the kind of unanimity that we felt during the Second World War. We knew that people held wildly diverse political beliefs during that war, but we didn't label them traitors as we do every night on cable television, and that somehow lesser people. And so I, I, I think we, we yearn, not for a simpler time, my goodness, that was a complex time. You know, people say, oh, the 30s and the 40s, those were the good old days. Well, the, the 30s saw the greatest economic dislocation in the history of the world, and the 40s saw the greatest cataclysm in the history of the world. We may live in simpler times, but we seem to have lost uh, the, the reminder that when we work together as Americans, we can achieve a whole lot of things, and that the secret... The secret of the war, as I've been suggesting, is in shared sacrifice. We made ourselves richer by that, by giving up things. We, 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 we made ourselves richer, and not just spiritually or communally richer. We made ourselves financially and materially richer by giving things up. It's a paradoxical equation, but it actually happened, and today we don't give up anything. We do not give up anything. We want our right to do this, to drive alone, to, to, to do this, and yet, we find ourselves impoverished in spirit and in some cases in some people financially but we're you know we're richer but we don't feel that way um, and I think that the second world war can remind us I, I just want to stress um, this film does not have a political bone in its body in a country that's right now torn on the bias about uh, about this particular war that it's in when Sam Hines says at the very beginning of the film uh, there's no such thing as a good war only necessary wars he that was an interview that we taped before the invasion of Iraq. Uh, most of the uh, film's whole plotting uh, was done before 9-11. 
And so what you're seeing is just the resonance of, of one war speaking to another. Just remember, the past is gone, we'll never get it back. And any attempt to think that you can is just sentimentality and nostalgia, and those are the enemies of truth, of, of good history in any form. But history is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past. And so it is informed by not only our desire to find out what happened then, but who we are now. And who we are now is informed very much by what we wish for ourselves. And so in another paradoxical way, the pursuit of history becomes the pursuit of our future. And if we don't have a past, we don't have a future. And that's what the great danger of those kids who think we fought with the Germans against the Russians are. You know, they're just so distracted by our glittering consumer present, the, the pact we've made with the devil, that they think if we just continue to acquire things, everything will be all right. And of course, it won't be all right. And we need each other in whatever form that comes, in faith, in community, in science, in empiricism, but we need each other um, to get through uh, these difficult times. All right, one question here. First, thank you, sir. And my question is actually two parts. First, what did you yourself do to get started? And second, what, what advice would you give to someone who also wishes to tell stories that need to be told through documentaries? Yeah, I, I went to Hampshire College in the fall of uh, 1971. I thought I was going to be the next Alfred Hitchcock or John Ford. And all my teachers were social documentary still photographers who reminded me quite correctly that there's much more drama in what is and what was than in anything the human imagination dreams up. And I found that all of my molecules were rearranged and I was going to become a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that the good news and the bad news with documentary filmmaking is that there is no career path. <laughs> the good news is obvious. Each, buddy, each person has their own individual path. The bad news is obvious. Each person has their own individual path, and you have to find that. And so you fall back on a couple of things that will sound to your ears like platitudes, but I think are actually true. First and foremost is you have to know who you are. That's the essence of, of success in anything. But it's no more true in a, in, a, in a situation like this where you have to understand that we are drawn to these subjects, uh, their glamour, their the, the, the filmmaking bu buzz, all of that sort of stuff. But it's a lot of hard work. And uh, my first year in film class, there were 70 people. And the next year, there were 30. And the next year, there were 10. And three of us graduated in film in 1975, but guess what? All three of us are still making films. That's and that's a hugely important thing, which leads to the second part, that particularly because there's no career path, nothing will be handed to you. Um, and you will have to persevere. There's many more um, good ideas than there are money to fund those good ideas, and many more talented filmmakers, and there's films that get made. So somewhere along the line, people are dropping out, not because they, they had a bad idea, not because they weren't good filmmakers, but they couldn't follow through. And I kept on my desk, the first film that I made for public television was on the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And I looked about 12 years old. I was in my mid-twenties, but I looked like I was 12 years old. And people would say to me, this child is trying to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. Ha, ha, ha. No. And I collected on my desk, I had two gigantic three-ring binders with literally, I swear to God, hundreds of rejection notices, which I kept there as a reminder of the fragility of this pursuit. And for years, I, I came close to starving as I made the film. But you know, it was nominated for an Academy Award, and uh, the rest is literally <laughs> history. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can have one here. Uh, well, first, I'm glad that you're one of the three that succeeded in this <laughs> Thank you. And, and I really look forward to seeing the seven hours of this wonderful program. I'm sorry to break the news. It's 14 and a yes. half hours and <laughs> seven, se parts. seven episodes, and, and I, I fully expect to be crucified for that. Well, well, I look forward to seeing the 14 and a half Thank hours. Thank you, sir. I hope you do. Uh, but I really would like to know about the number of hours that went into making yes. the 14 and a wow. half. And, and will years. we ever get an opportunity to see the outtakes or, or what's left on the cutting room floor? Because I'm sure there's many stories left there. Yes, sir. Yes, and, sir. And also in episode seven that we saw this evening, yeah. uh, which I think is extraordinary, the word Holocaust was never mentioned. Yes, sir. Is it mentioned in part that we didn't see? No. And why? 
Um, I can answer that question. Nobody said it in our film, and it's such an overused word uh, that we wanted to make this fresh. We could have taken an objective approach to the Holocaust and told you what was going on, but in fact we allowed three ordinary people from our towns to, to sort of stumble upon these places and be shocked again, as we need to continually be shocked uh, by the fact of that uh, mass killing. Um, you know, I come from New Hampshire right now. I've lived for the last 30 years in New Hampshire, and we make maple syrup. And it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And that's a lot like documentary filmmaking. We, <laughs> over the course of the last six and a half years, we've gone through an even higher ratio. We've, we've looked at thousands of hours of footage, tens of thousands of photographs, perhaps 60 or 70,000 photographs. We've gone through hundreds of hours of transcripts of interview and spent the time trying to digest it. And, and if you could imagine maybe to beg your indulgence and submit another metaphor, that it's much like the sculptor bringing a block of stone uh, to the studio and chipping away. The rubble on the floor is the negative space of creation that has to be honored in some way as much as what remains. And we're very mindful of what goes in. But very little of that is actually able to form into another entity. It's all diverse things. And the cutting room floor, just like the sculptor's studio, is not filled with bad things, mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, but in fact very good things that just didn't fit. If you saw the movie Amadeus, at one point the uh, arrogant emperor Franz Joseph says, too many notes. And um, we know what that is. That can be a beautiful note or a series of notes or a chord, but there are too many notes. And it's my job to do this for you, to do that winnowing. Now at the same time, you, you finish a film and you've had this piece of sculpture left, but there are several things that uh, have been left on the cutting room floor that in and of themselves, if I told you about it, you'd say, oh, what an idiot, why didn't you put them in? And if I put them in in the editing room, you'd see the way in which they destabilize that scene or that particular episode. And so what we've been able to do with the miracle of DVD and other stuff is to add some extras. So if you have an opportunity to see the DVDs that will be out uh, just at the time of the uh, broadcast of the film, you'll see a lot of the other scenes and the behind the scenes of making this film that might go some way towards answering your question, but never all of us. You know, it's, it's all about story, and we got the, the blueprint from Aristotle, if you've read the poetics about the beginning and the middle and the end and the climax and character development. Right. It's why when your wife says, honey, how was your day, you don't say, I backed slowly down the driveway to avoid the garbage can, went out in the street, pulled up to the stop sign, and turned my blinker on. You hire me to get rid of that part of the story and cut to the chip. You'll never believe what that SOB did to me at work today. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more over here. I have a question about how you selected the, the towns that you focused yes. on. I imagine there must be thousands of towns across the of country course. with great stories. What was the deciding factor in each case? You know, that's a really good question, and I really want to stress, I wish I could tell you truthfully that we chose the towns like a dart on a map, because that's sort of what we wanted to do. We wanted to pick places that were completely random and arbitrary, that most of us here would not have associations or preconceptions with, not have baggage and expectations that we'd bring into to it so that we could go into these towns and whatever we discovered would be true, would be true. And that's what we were looking for. If we picked Brooklyn or Boston in the Northeast, it would come with, we'd have to talk about the Dodgers or the Red Sox, and we'd had to do all sorts of different things. Uh, we didn't have to do that with Waterbury. We could just go in and find out what we found out. Um, we live in the Northeast, and so Waterbury was a place we'd pass through, and it seemed so down on its luck and interesting that we needed to get to know it, and we did. Uh, we read a remarkable memoir called With the Old Breed, the best memoir I've read about war, uh, patriotic and also incredibly honest about the brutality of war on all sides. And it was written by Sid's best friend, Eugene Sledge, and when we got to Mobile, he had just passed away. But his family introduced us to Sid, and Sid introduced us to Catherine, and they introduced us to some friends of theirs, and we then cast our net wider in Mobile and found in that remarkable town a wonderful story of the war at every level and strata of society. We knew we wanted to tell the Japanese-American story because of the monumental hypocrisy embedded in that, and didn't want to pick the familiar West Coast towns and so pick Sacramento. And then we were left, all of those had, at the time of Pearl Harbor, about 100,000 people. We just wanted to pick 
a small town, much like the one I live in, New Hampshire, with just uh, you know just a few thousand people or even a few hundred people, and we um, wanted it to be in the Midwest, the remaining section of the country. And we met a pilot, Quentin Annison from Laverne. He lived outside of Washington for most of his life, and his first day of work, by the way, was June 6, 1944. More on that later. Um, and uh, we, after hearing his remarkable story, I said, where are you from? He said, Laverne, Minnesota. And so we went there. We discovered Al McIntosh. Uh, we who's, got, who's, who's, uh, who's the newspaper by, well, editor. And his voice is Hank. Read by Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, right. Um, and it was an amazing thing. And, and it's the intimacy of Laverne that also helps this film a lot. You get to know the whole town. And as Jim Sherman says, if you don't want people to know what you're doing, you don't do it, which is exactly like the little town I live in, too. And I think we all recognize that kind of, the, the sort of the, the rewards and penalties of intimacy. And so they're chosen randomly and haphazardly in, in I think, a really wonderful way. And we recorded uh, Al McIntosh with Tom Hanks, and he wrote us back and said, I'm dreaming of him. Do you have any more? And we went back into the microfilm and found more, and he recorded more, and, and, and Al is in there as many times as, as anybody in the film and really is a, a kind of a guide. He's about as far away from the action as you could possibly be. If you wanted to be safe in the Second World War, you would do no better than to move to Laverne, Minnesota. The Japanese weren't going to come in from the west and the Germans weren't going to come in from the east no matter what Hitler had planned and uh, yet the war was there every single day. He could watch Scotty Dewars, the depot agent, walk across the street. Uh, to deliver a telegram to a family, Ray Lester, and he'd say, which son? And he'd find out. He'd watch a young mother reluctantly take her 17-year-old son over to Sioux Falls, the nearest big city, so that he can enlist in the Navy, only to come back to find that her oldest son, Raymond, had been killed in Normandy. And we went to Normandy, and in that sea of crosses there, we found Raymond Smoke's gravestone and filmed it, that personalized it in a way, so that D-Day's this huge event, but if you're there at one person's waking up in the middle of the night to find about it, it, it makes it something that you can understand too, and that's the access. That's the Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole that you can go into, just like Glenn Frazier. Where do you start a film about the biggest cataclysm in all of hum human history? You start with Glenn Frazier, whose girlfriend says, I think I'm interested in someone else. And he's so angry and upset that he goes through this stuff and all of a sudden this God-fearing boy can't face his pastor or his parents and he's suddenly enlisted in the army and a few months later he's caught in the Bataan death march and a few months after that he's in a Japan prisoner of war camp and a few months after that he's watching American bombers come overhead and a few months after that he's digging his grave as they set up machine gun nests and a few minutes after that he is walking out of a prison camp into a stunned and dazed populace that has just surrendered and that's one... <coughs> millionth of the story of Glenn Frazier, and there'll be 40 people like that that you'll get to know. Do we have time for one more? Of course, I'm happy to, to, to okay, answer one more. your question. Hi, Ken. Uh, Hi. Thanks for presenting your film. Um, I had one question. Uh, what made you choose that particular image for your poster over all the others? This is a really good question, and maybe we can go out on, on this, and I apologize to those people whose questions weren't asked, uh, and hopefully we can continue this conversation once the film is out and you've had a chance to see it. Um, we were struggling. This is a film filled with hundreds of images, wonderful and horrifying, but we were telling a personal bottom-up story, so we knew in the end we wanted to do a soldier in combat. Um, we wanted to get a sense of the cost of the war. This is a film that asked the question, what was it like to be in that war? And, and I think by extension, what was it like to be at home, as Catherine was, worrying about the people that you loved in that war? Um, we had a lot of different images, but this one, the hollow-eyedness yes. of this guy, and as you now saw, the secret of our image is that he is one quarter of a litter bearer, part of the Graves registration crews, uh, in Saipan in particular, at that point the bloodiest battle for Americans in the Pacific War to date. It'll get worse, by the way, at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, but at that point Saipan is the, the, the nadir of this uh, struggle. And it seems to me that his expression says it's all. It's all. It's very intimate. It's very personal. He's letting you know how he feels. And yet there's something so remote and so untouchable and unknowable. 
the photograph is from, I believe, the, the National Archives. They were unable to identify who that was. It was just Graves Registration Crew, Saipan, uh, summer of 44. Um, we searched, we put out inquiries in the Internet, and just a few weeks ago we got a call from a man who said, I am 99.99% sure that that's my uncle. And we said, oh, we're so grateful. We still had time to, to label it for the book cover that this is. And he said, I, but I don't want you to say his name. Um, and we honored that. He said that his, both his father and his uncle had been in graves registration, that it had taken a terrible toll on them. They came back from the war completely haunted with the post-traumatic stress syndrome that is now labeled and familiar from subsequent wars. And that they both died early on. They had been heavy drinkers. The war had really killed them eventually. And he said, and, and we'd prefer that this be set aside. But in the course of telling us, he said that this gentleman, before he was in the Army, worked in a factory in Waterbury, Connecticut. Wow. So we just, out of all the thousands of images, uh, wow. it came back and we felt a sense of how incredibly connected we all are um, by this and we just said of course it is we'll honor your 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 thing but I think it's amazing that young man uh, worked in Waterbury Connecticut perhaps making the brass buttons that wow. that every soldier uh, British or an American war and I was at a screening not like dissimilar to this in San Francisco a few months ago and a young boy came up and gave me one of the buttons that, that his grandfather wore and it says on the back made in Waterbury, Connecticut, wow. USA. And uh, you begin to see the way in which we're connected uh, to this. And I hope that in a way this film reminds us of that shared sacrifice and reminds us more that we have much more reasons to cohere as a people than we do to, to, to not. And that we can ignore the kind of chatter, the, the sort of the drone of this current media culture and look at e each other's neighbors with a kind of a new, renewed sense of brotherhood and purpose. Um, thank you all for not only your brotherhood and purpose tonight, but your patience. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Ken.